<laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is recording now, so I can't curse, right? <laughs> I appreciate those of you that came back. Thank you. Uh, this will be a little bit different. Uh, those of you that are new, there'll be, there'll be uh, hopefully some good come out of this. Uh, I did put my contact info up there. If I can ever help with anything, feel free. Uh, I'll try to get back to you. Uh, I live a hectic life. Uh, I've got three daughters. We've adopted an eight-year-old boy. Well, he's nine now, I guess. We've had him for about six years, but we made it official. And I, I have never been around young boys before. This is new. I had three daughters, and, and uh, they're very different. Uh, my daughters, when I tucked them into bed, it was good night, sweetheart. I love you. You're such a good, you know, and, and it was real that way. And with him, I'm like, good night. See you, kid. You know, I, what do you do? <laughs> it's, it's very different. So I'm learning as I go. But he is also a... a uh, 100 miles an hour all day long uh, until he hits the pillow and then he's thankfully he's out uh, so that combined with with coaching uh, and our our crew is a big crew we've got 110 120 kids on our track team at Hardy and uh, it, it's busy I, I coach the distance runners I coach the pole vaulters uh, the javelin throwers and the high jumpers very diverse group uh, so it, it's it's uh, it's just 100 miles an hour every day. So I will, if I don't respond, if you get hold of me, I'm saying all that to tell you, don't be afraid to email me again or call me again and say, hey, coach, uh, what do you think? Or, what, or you know, what, what, however I can help, I'd be happy to, and I'll do the best I can with that. So feel free to do that. What I want to talk uh, this session about is, is how to set up a year and, and how to implement that uh, in a way that, uh, kind of like we talked about in the previous session, that, that every athlete has an opportunity to become the best that they can become. Uh, this works for me. Again, I don't know, y'all are in very different situations up here than, than we are in Arkansas or have been in Texas. You know, the, the weather is, is very different. Uh, the, your rules are different than ours and to some extent, I'm sure, too. So there are some things you can and can't do. So I, again, I'll tell you, adapt. Uh, what you can, but I hope you hear the message I'm going to give, and, and hopefully there are some things you can take away from this that might help uh, as we go on. I'm going to start off and, and brag on some of our kids. Harding University, I, I would dare say, how many of you have ever heard of it? That's what I thought. A couple, right? It's not a place kids grow up thinking, I'm going to go run for Harding. Man, I can't wait. There are two or three maybe across the country that who had parents that went there, grandparents, and they want to go to a private Christian school in a town of 20,000 people, but not many. So, so we don't get necessarily the top level recruits, the guys and girls that are coming out of high school that are competing for national championships and those type things. I put a list up here and I love to brag on these kids of, of some of the guys that we've gotten and some of the girls that we've gotten and what their high school PRs were and what they've done a year or two or three years into our program. Again, I don't know that anybody would recruit a lot of these kids coming out with big scholarship money. This, this guy is a freshman this year, he's, he's talented. These other guys were pretty average. You know, pretty average kids. Uh, the girls, you know, I, she's okay, I guess, coming out of high school, but these are pretty average. Pretty average times across the board. Not, not kids that are highly recruited. Some are talented, uh, some are not. Uh, some came to school because of the school and said, oh, you have a cross country team? Yeah, I think I'll join. Others, others came because they wanted to run cross country at this type of school. So there, there's, a, there's a wide range of motivations and, and reasons for being a part of this. And, and, Pulling that into one, one alley, you know, is, is kind of hard sometimes. But we've had we've had some good improvements. Uh, I mean, if you look across, and I won't go person by person, but it's kind of it's kind of neat to see uh, what some of them have done in a year or two years or or, or more. So I, I feel like what we're doing is working. Now, obviously, we've got more kids than that. Not everybody has gotten tremendously better. Some have some have stayed pretty much what they were. But I'm I'm going to tell you. In my opinion, they're not very committed. They don't do in the summer. 
what they need to do. They don't do in the winter what they need to do. They don't live the lifestyle that you've got to live in order for this to happen. These are the ones that have bought in the most. And, and the results are pretty incredible uh, for some of them. Uh, and we'll talk more as, as we kind of go through this. But I just, I just, I mean, I'm proud of them. Really. It's really fun uh, to see them when they came in. You know, the, the goal was kind of hoping we could maybe compete for a conference title, you know, at some point. And now our, our girls are really young. So they're, they're kind of going through what the guys have gone through the last couple of years, but our, our guys are to the age now where they're thinking about qualifying for the National League. And that's, that's a huge step, you know, in where we were as to where we're trying to go. This is my fourth season at Harding. And I, I tried really hard when I came in to honor every kid who had been there, that we weren't gonna cut people, that, you know, it wasn't my fault <laughs> that they weren't running what they wanted to run. And so we let everybody finish out. And with the girls, we had a lot of sophomores and juniors when I got there. So it took two or three years for them to, to, to graduate and move on. And so we've got a really good crew uh, of kids who have come in. So I think we'll see some good things happen with them. Our guys, a lot of them have been our new. We had a big group of seniors when I got in and they finished. And we were able to recruit some pretty, pretty decent kids in that, that, wanted to be, that wanted to be good. So we've got a really good culture that I think has been created. Uh, they, they have all come to Harding because they believe in what Harding is about. Uh, they, they're very faithful kids. They're very, they're very driven kids. Uh, they're, they're very loyal uh, to what the school stands for and, and for what we're trying to accomplish as a team. And I think that's a huge part of it. So I think we've gotten the right kids in. And some of them have some talent uh, to go along with that uh, that they just didn't know about. Uh, so it's... I just say all that to let you know that if, if this, in our situation, what I'm going to show you today works really well, and I, I hope it will for you. I think some things make sense. You know, every year I have these high aspirations. Uh, my dad and my brothers always laugh at me because they ask, how are you going to be this year? And, and my response is always, I think we can be really good this year. We got a chance to, to win this or to do that. And when it doesn't happen, they'll come back and, you know, it's, Christmas is always kind of tough. But when it does happen, it's like, I told you so. It just doesn't happen enough. But what I've learned over the years uh, that no matter what my plan is, if we don't accomplish these three things, we're not going to be very good. So, and, and I, I think I put these in order, I think, of what's most important. You've got to stay healthy. An injured athlete, I was going to take him out back and shoot him. You know, they, they, can't, they can't do anything for you. They're injured. No matter how talented they are, no matter, no matter what their past times are, if they're injured, and I'm sorry, you know, they're done. And our seasons are so short that it's, it's very difficult to get through a stress fracture and come back or, or you know, an IT band issue or something like that and come back and have a successful year. Uh, so primary, and we, that you've got to keep that in mind and preach that to your kids. I was a distance runner, so I can say this, okay? We are the dumbest people on earth. <laughs> Academically, we do really well, right? We make, our cross country kids tend to do really well, but we are the dumbest people on earth. I'll wake up in the morning, my knee hurts. Well, maybe if I just run a little bit, it'll go away. <laughs> what are you thinking? I don't feel good today, but I, I, I think I can still get these repeats in. Man, I got an ache in the top of my foot, but if I just rub it out, it'll, it'll be okay. Coach, I was six miles in and I felt this, but I, I needed to finish my run. What are you thinking? You know, that, but, but that's, that's also you know, why some of them end up being really good, because they, they just want to keep going. But you've got to preach this to your kids that they can't be afraid to come to you and say, I just, coach, this something's not right. Could I do something else today? You may even have to approach them. You can see sometimes when something, you know, is that kid's limping a little bit or is kind of shaking out a little bit and it's different. Maybe come up to them and go, you know, you feeling something? What's wrong? Now, coach, you know, I woke up and my knees hurt. Oh man, we don't want that to let's do Let's do a bike today. Let's put you in the pool today. Something, 
uh, to, to keep them healthy. Motivation. Now, one of, my, one of my heroes in track and field coaching is a guy named Dan Path. Dan, Dan is this, I can't even carry on a conversation with him, he's so smart. Uh, I heard him lecture one time towards the end of his, now he's still in it, but towards the end of his really high level career. And he, he said some things that blew me away because he is, he is a genius. And he said, you know, I spent, I, I spent my whole career working on technical and, and, and physiological and biomechanical parts of athletes. He said, and I've come to realize that maybe motivating a kid is more important than what you teach them all the time. He said, and, and his point was kind of, he's seen some coaches that don't know much do really good things because they could they could keep those kids going. And it, it was really, it, it was eye-opening to me uh, for him to admit that he felt like he could have gotten more out of more kids if he had spent more time internally, you know, working working on the fire, you know, and keeping them at a, at a higher level of, of desire. So I, I, motivation is huge. When we bring recruits in, one of the things I tell them is I am not a genius coach. I don't know it all. I, I, if you ask me to explain the science of some of this, sorry. But I do know how to keep you working and how to not, maybe not mess you up <laughs> so that, so that when, when it comes time, you're going to be ready. And I think that's a whole lot of it. It's keeping them motivated, keeping them inspired to do the things that they need to do. Distance running is hard. It's hard. You know, with, with, with you guys, I don't know how. I don't know how people do it up here and stay in shape unless you've got treadmills and I hate treadmills or running around the school or gosh how many laps around the gym today coach you know <laughs> come on it's tough but it's zero degrees outside what can you do uh, the things they sacrifice in order to do this the mornings the weekends the, the time with friends the aches they go through is very different than any other event so keeping them motivated is is a huge part of our jobs as coaches. And lastly, to finish better than we started. To me, that goes across the board. We want, we want our workouts to build that way. We want our, our weeks to be that way. We want our months to be that way. We want our seasons to be that way, that we finish better than we started, which often means we have to hold back a little bit at the start so that we don't come in. My, my first day coaching at Hardy, uh, we were, I say it's the first week, we were gonna get in and do a, kind of a, an aerobic test to see where we were. And I told the guys, I want you to run at this pace. Well, you know how it goes. New coach, I'm gonna impress him, here we go. So we, we run the first 400, they're seven seconds faster. Seven seconds faster. And we're taking a short rest, and I'm looking at them, and they're not ready to go again. I said, you know what? Workout's over. Y'all go home. If you can't do what I ask, we're not going to do this. I said, I'm home. They couldn't believe it. We come back the next time. I said, I want you to run this pace. Okay, coach. Guess what? They hit the pace. And they did. They finished the whole workout. How many times have you seen kids start a workout, and they crush the first one, and then the next one's a little worse, and then, and then they're done. And you maybe had eight or 10 or 12 or 14 reps scheduled, and you get four. What have you accomplished? What have they accomplished? Nothing. So I, I preach hard to our kids, and I will, I will stop them when they can't stay on the pace or if they start too fast, because we need to teach control. We've got to teach control. It's just emotions will lie to us and will lie to them. And if their emotions overcome their common sense, we're not getting much good out of them. So we, we do everything at a very prescribed pace. And even when we get to the last ones, we tell them, okay, you can drop it a little bit, but don't crush it. Just stay on pace, stay on pace. And you know, when they finish, you know what they do? They go, Coach, that's pretty good. I feel pretty good. So next time we come back and do this workout, let's run a second or two faster per rep. I think I can do that. And 
we get to the point where by the end of the year, they can look back and go, wow, look how much better I am. And I, uh, to me, that's, that's a huge part of our, <clears throat> our, our makeup, our, our philosophy when we do this. And we'll talk about that more as we go through. How are these things accomplished? How do you keep them healthy? How do you keep them motivated? How do you finish better than you started? Well, obviously, what you do in the preseason is huge. There's nothing more important than, than summer running. But we hear that all the time, and we know that. And the kids know that, and yet they still, a lot of times, won't do it. Uh, finding a way to make that happen, I think, is, is the most essential thing we can do because it prepares them for the work to come. Uh, there is no substitute for that. And if we're not pushing that and encouraging that, I think that's a, a huge mistake on our part. Find a way, find a way to get them there, to get that to happen. Second thing, I think having appropriate levels of work that we expect from them and appropriate levels of intensity is, is essential. Uh, it's got to be individualized. You can't expect a freshman to do what a senior is doing. Very often. <laughs> There's exceptions to that, but very often. You shouldn't be able to. They ought to be at different levels. So I, we, and I talked about this earlier, we, we have our kids come in and they tell me what, they, what their maxes are. What, what have they done mileage-wise? What are their best times? What are, the, what are their PRs? And then everything we do is geared off of that for that kid. And so they have input into what their workouts are going to be. And we'll, we'll show you some later in this to, to give you an idea on that. Intensity also, and we got to remember, we got to remember there are outside sources that create intensity outside of their running. You know, when our kids first come to college, and, and same thing when you have kids starting up the year in high school or junior high, there's stresses that we don't know about. I don't know if you guys can remember junior high. That was a stressful time. There's a lot going on. And to expect them to be totally focused on just running and put everything they have into that is probably foolish on our part. So we always, our first week or two of school, I back off a little bit. We don't, we don't come in and try to hit it hard early. We give them some time. We may even schedule a day or two off so that they've got opportunities to, to engage their stresses and, and get past that. We'll go three quality days per week is the most we'll do. By quality days, I'm talking about days that, that kind of wear them out. It could be a long run, you know, whatever a long run would be to, to your athletes. That, that's a quality day for us. It can be a, a tempo run, a hard tempo run, an interval run, a hill workout, a race. We're going we're gonna to limit ourselves to three quality days per week. And the other days we're just running or cross training uh, so that they've got time to, to refresh their, their, their hearts right, and their bodies at the same time, that they're, they're able to recover. Smart trades. What in the world do you mean, Coach? Well, <laughs> again, we're not, our, our, our runners sometimes don't think with their their minds, they think with their hearts. For instance, a smart trade. Take what the day gives. I wake up this morning and I'm running a fever. But coach has mile repeat schedule. Can, you know, really? Is that the best thing to do? Maybe we take that kid and say, you know what? Why don't you just jog easy today and, and get a little med ball circuit in and then you go home and rest. Okay, coach, can I do it tomorrow? No, well, you can't make up what you missed. But we'll get back in with it. If you feel better tomorrow, we'll get back with the show and, and, and you'll move on from there. But maybe it's better you don't do this today because they might tough it out. They might tough it out and get through the workout and then really get sick and miss the next week. Or maybe, maybe they're scheduled for 45 miles that week and it's up to Saturday, the last day, and they're seven miles away. They're at 38 miles. I'm going to get 45 miles. That's going to be a record for me. Man, but my, my knee and my hip are kind of hurting a little bit. But I, maybe if I just run it, it'll be all right, okay? So here I go. Well, yeah, I got my 45, but now I've got an IT band that's inflamed, and I missed the next three weeks of training. 
Was that a good trade? I mean, no. But they don't have the courage sometimes to come to the coach and say, Coach, I just don't know if I can or if it would be smart today. We've got to have the relationship and maybe the awareness to see those kind of things and, and make those kind of trades. Maybe an hour on the bicycle would have been just as good. And then we've still got them the next two weeks. We don't, we don't trade one day for the next 10. Same thing with paces. You know, maybe they're not feeling, you know, I don't know about you guys. My body's different every day. <laughs> I wake up some days and my handwriting is good, and the next day it's, it's, it's horrible. I wake up some days and I can actually touch my toes, and other days if I get my knees, man, I'm doing really good. There are some days I'll go for a run and, yo, man, I can, I can pop out some pretty good miles, and the next day it's kind of like, <laughs> you know, 100% is not always the same. 80% is not always the same. You can see it in the weight room. When kids go into lift and they may max out one week and, and hit up so much weight, and two weeks later you max again and they're 10, 15 pounds different, lower or higher. So to assign, assign hard and fast, you gotta run this pace or you're, you're failing this workout, that there's gotta be room in there for how they're feeling and, and allow for that or maybe even in the number of reps that they're doing, that maybe it's not there today, so we're gonna cut you back one so that you can finish this workout and still live to train another day, live to train another week or another month. That We're not gonna be a, a, a hero today and then you're dead for the next few days. That's, that's been one of the things that as we finally gotten that through to our kids, man, it has prolonged our training without injuries tremendously. We've had guys that have never finished a season actually go a whole year and a half and, and not have to miss a meet uh, because they're, they're courageous enough or in tune enough to speak up and say, Coach, maybe, maybe today I need to get in the pool. And that's okay. That's hard for us as coaches because we want the whole team there. Right, man, and, and you're the one I've been waiting to see do this workout, and now you're telling me you can't? But you can't tell them that because they'll go, okay, coach, I'll do it then. Yeah. Yeah, you do it, but then you just shot them. So we, we've got to have enough confidence in what we're doing over the big picture to, to sacrifice a day, right, in order to gain the season. And then I, I you know, when I walked in this morning, uh, oh, I can't remember names or anything, but she was finishing up her lecture. I think she was getting into this kind of stuff at the end. Guys, this is so important. Preaching this, you know, culture tells you don't get involved in your kids' lives. That's baloney. That's baloney. They are dying for someone to get involved in their lives and to help them be better people and to tell them what's right and tell them what's wrong. They are dying for that. Don't be afraid to speak up and tell them what's right. You can't do that and be the best you can be. You can't listen to that junk and expect good thoughts in your head. You can't drink that stuff and be a good athlete. Don't, don't be, I mean, you need to, do, they may argue with it. You may get a phone call, how dare you? Well, you know, I'm the coach and I know that they, that hurts them. If they don't like it, they can quit. But we've got to stand up and tell them what's right and what's wrong. But these kind of things, if you can, if you can actually get them to buy into the lifestyle that it takes to be successful, it's amazing what can happen. They don't know what a different sleep makes on their confidence. They go two or three nights of not sleeping, they, they're, they're worthless. Because they're weak, they're deprived. Nutrition, man, what you eat makes a difference in how you feel. It, we'll have kids come in on a visit and their parents will ask, do you have a nutritionist who advises our kids? I said, yeah, you know, we've got a nutrition department and they'll work with them. I said, but is it really that hard? They know what to eat. And my response is always to them, you know, at some point you got to grow up. You got to grow up and take control of what you eat. Go past the cookies, all right? Drive past the donut store. Quit drinking the coffee with all the junk in it. Drink water. Make your plate colorful. 
If it leaves grease underneath it, it's probably not real good for you. You know, it's not hard. And at some point, we got to teach them and, and convict them of, of what it takes to be good. Their companions, who they hang out with. I love, I love the example. You know, you want to see what people think about you? Look at your four closest friends. And that's how people see you. Tell that to your kids. And some of them will go, ooh, I never thought about that. Do your friends lift you up or do they pull you down? Do they encourage you in what you do or do they try to pull you away? We used to say that they'll steal your game. You know, there are people out there who will try to steal your game because they're jealous of successful people. And they'll try to hold you down. What you listen to, what you tell yourself. You know, there, how many of you guys were distance runners? Wow, that's good. That's good. Do you remember that point of the race where you would listen to what you were saying to yourself? Really good runners here. Yes, I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and other ones go, I don't think I can do this anymore. This hurts. Uh, I'm going to back off a little. Maybe if I back off a little, bit, you know, you, you talk yourself in or you talk yourself out. And that can be trained. That can be trained. It has to be trained, right? Kids who doubt themselves rarely overcome their expectations. We can encourage them, and I think that helps, but they need to practice. They need to hear themselves. I tell our kids, every time you say something negative about yourself, you need to slap yourself on the side of the head and say, no, I'm better than that. I'll tell them when they're racing, when they're running their races or going through training. One of the things I'll yell at them is, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? And you'll see something, and all of a sudden, they'll pick it up. They'll, they'll start getting positive again. I, one of my idols growing up, nobody knows him. He wasn't that great, but I, I thought he was a stud because he was a 14-something three-miler. And uh, he tells me the story that he would run, and his mom asked him one day, do you hate running? And he goes, no, I love it. She goes, well, why do you look so miserable? What do you mean? She goes, you always have this horrible look on your face. If you enjoy it, why don't you look like it? So he said, oh, you know, I never thought about that. He said the very next race he ran, he made sure he had a smile on his face the whole time. He said, I PR'd by 25 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Don't we feel better, right? When you, when you force a pleasant look on your face, there are days that I walk into the gym and people will go, ooh, what's wrong with you? Nothing. Oh, you sure look grumpy. Sorry. It, it makes a difference. And those are little things, but man, they make a tremendous difference in, in their overall well-being and in their performance and how long they will last uh, as they're training through the season and through their careers. So I, I think if, if we can teach these things, man, the chances of them staying healthy, if they're getting their sleep before midnight and eating right and hanging out with the right people, yeah, who wouldn't want that? Everybody makes sacrifices. You, know, you got to, sometimes you got to cut off the dead weight in order to, to move up to the top. Uh, again, I would encourage you, don't be afraid to preach that. Uh, now, I wouldn't call names. <laughs> don't say, you need to stay away from old so-and-so. She, she's horrible for you. I wouldn't go that far, but they, they know who you're talking about. All right, make it our plan. There's got to be a goal. My, my personal goal when we set up our training is that I, I want volume over intensity. I would rather them have a, a whole lot at a medium level than a very little at a real high level for the year. The more we run, the better we get. My, my, my hope is that we are creating greater capacity to move oxygen and, and to use it. The more, the better we get at that, the higher level we can perform at and still be aerobic, which is the goal, right? You can't run a 5K race and aerobically. Now, I mean, I've never, I, I don't think you can. Have you tried it before? <laughs> no, it doesn't work. But what we forget sometimes is that, that it's an aerobic event. The 3200 is an aerobic event. The 1500 is mostly that way, right? So that, that's, to me, that's primary. You get that from volume. You run a lot through the summer and through the season. You run a lot for that to happen. 
And it's amazing, as they run more, they become more technically efficient. They get better gas mileage. Less, less of the clomping, right? And all of a sudden, you, they just kind of, you see it. It's beautiful when it happens. When somebody just clicks all of a sudden, the, the body weight gets right, you know, and the, the, the style gets right, and they get a little stronger, and all of a sudden they flow instead of, right, stomping. That, that can only happen with a lot of running. We're gonna work on strength. Our kids get in the weight room, and we'll talk about that some tomorrow. We do a lot of stuff with med balls. We do a lot of hurdle mobility, you know, walk over so our hips and, and, and hammies stay loose. Uh, we do a lot of uh, body weight circuits. Uh, there's something almost every day that we do to, to, to create or increase strength and mobility so that they're better athletes. And then we work a little bit on speed. Not a lot. <laughs> But, but enough so that they don't lose what they've got. Most kids become distance runners because they don't have much of this. So to spend a whole lot of time trying to make a mule uh, thoroughbred is probably not well spent. What I've learned is as they get into better shape, they tend to have better finishes. They get faster because they learn to run better and they get, it means more to them. And, and a lot of times finishing speed is a whole lot more about heart than it is about just how flat out fast I am. But we will, we incorporate, you know, 100 meter strides and 150 strides and maybe even some 200s uh, throughout the year so that they don't, they don't forget how to run fast. But that's, that's kind of where, where I start, is, is keeping in mind, as much as I want to work them hard, I want to work them a bunch. So we map it out. I'll sit down in the summer and I'm going to write out the entire year. From the beginning of June or whenever we're going to start, middle of May, that we're going to start our summer plan, all the way through when they come back to school, when our retreat's going to be, when we're going to have our landmark workouts, when our races are going to be, when our championships are, when our winter break is. When is, when is Halloween, when is Thanksgiving, when is Christmas, when is prom, when is spring break, all those things, we, we work all that in. When is, when is conference championships and it's sectionals and it's state, whatever, how, whatever order it goes in, all that's mapped in and I'm gonna, I'm gonna write in the workouts. I'm gonna, I'm gonna count dates and figure out what fits where and how much we can get of each type of training. Now in cross country, when we start in the fall, I'm gonna start at our final date and work, work my way back. Because I, I, can't, I can't go up to it and then say, okay, oh wait, I gotta, so we, we're gonna start at the last date and then work our way back so that the last two weeks or, or four weeks or whatever flows into championship season. So keeping that in mind, I'm gonna run these slides backwards to where we'll start in the summertime. So our, our preseason preparation, I want as many weeks of that as we can. When our track season finishes, which kind of like you guys, we have different kids at different levels. Some finish at our conference meet, some finish at, at our, right before our national meet, and some will go on in the nationals. And then some will actually compete in the summertime for a little bit. So everybody kind of has a different ending date. But regardless, we're going to take 8 to 15 days off after the season's over, after track season's over. Normally, that's going to be the month of May. You guys go into June, don't you, for track season? So it's, it's a little bit different. When does your cross country start? August. August. Wow, that's a short turnaround. So you may, you may cut that. You may have a longer break in the winter time. Your winter may be more like our summer, right? So again, adapt it, adapt it to what works. But we want to get as many weeks as possible of, of summer training. And, and again, I'm, I'm a fan of just running. And I'll encourage them, don't you dare run the same route every day. <laughs> go somewhere. Plan Saturdays, man. You got rivals from another, from another high school. Let's go meet up at such and such place Saturday morning. Let's go run. You got old friends that are off in college now. Call them up. You know, are you in town? Let's go for a run. Let's go meet somewhere and go run. Let's drive into the city. Let's go run the trail. Let's do something. So there's a variety of what they're doing. But just long runs. We will include some strides afterwards. We'll occasionally, maybe every 10 to 14 days, 
throw in some type of a, a little bit of an up-tempo so there's just a break in the monotony and we, we don't forget how to run a little bit faster. But it might be maybe maybe every 10 to, to 15 days we'll do something like that. But primarily they're just running. We're continuing some strength work. Right? They're still doing their circuits, their body weight circuits and their, their, their core work. Uh, but it's a, it's a great time where they can build that volume up, they, they strengthen up a little bit, and they become more efficient runners. They also come into the season anxious to do something hard. And that's, that's good. The worst thing you can do is finish up the summer training and they go, oh, oh it's season now. Oh, gosh, here we go. They need to come into the season going, Coach, I'm ready for some work, man. Let's go. And if all they've done is long, easy runs, for the most part, they're going to be ready for that, physically and mentally. So after preseason, we start up, we start up with, with uh, we'll go about six to eight weeks. And again, we're going really high volume. It's not real intense as far as the speed of it, but we are, we're going to do a lot of work at, at that almost, almost, peak level. Some people measure that with heart rate. Some people measure that with, with experience, I guess. Uh, we, we tend to go by breathing. I, I love, and I think it's a great indicator, it, if you can maintain a, a two steps to breathe out and two steps to breathe in, you're running at a pretty good level. When you lose that, when it turns into, <sighs> you're probably running too hard. You're probably going past that point. And what I try to tell my kids is, you guys have to understand, your, your aerobic capacity, there, there's a ceiling here. And if you cross that line, you, you're going to go into debt. You can't go across that line. We don't need to cross that line too often because that's a different system, right? It's not what we're trying to do. So let's take, let's get to that point and maybe just bump it. What you'll find is if you do this consistently over time, that level will rise. It'll rise. And they can do the same kind of workout at a higher level without going into debt because they've been patient enough to let that rise if they're consistent with what they're doing. So we'll have three or four different kinds of workouts. We'll do, we'll center around a long run and that's either going to be a, a Saturday, Sunday, or Monday for us. And it's going to be whatever percentage you feel like they can handle. Our better guys, which will be 25% of their, of their mileage, which for some will be up to 15 miles. Most of our girls is going to be a 10 to 12 mile run. Uh, again, if they're a 30 mile a week person, eight miles is, is a long run. It's a long run. It's, it's different for every person. Let it be different. Don't take your whole team out and drop them off at 15 miles and say, I'll see you back at school. <laughs> that they won't survive very long if, if that's what you do. Drop them off at 15, at 12, at 9, at 8, at 6, at 3, whatever, whatever a long run is for them. And let them have some success and, and do that. But that, that's one of our quality workouts is getting a good long run in. We'll drive out to a dirt road or somewhere and let them, let them go get lost <laughs> sometimes. Uh, We'll do hill runs. We'll incorporate hill runs during this six to eight week period. Usually once a week for, for about five or six weeks, we'll, we'll find a hill. We've got a place in our town that's about a thousand meter hill. It's on pavement, but it, it's a beautiful place. There's no traffic and it, it gets steeper the further you go. Uh, they love it. <laughs> they call it Mount Hood. <laughs> uh, with, without, uh, they never smile when they say that though. <laughs> But we will do long intervals up that hill. We are not sprinting up the hill. We're, we're teaching them how to run efficiently up the hill. I love the hills because it doesn't pound you as much as running on a flat surface. They can do a lot of work and get a lot of miles in a really short time period. Because if we're doing repeat 800s up the hill, they're getting an 800 coming back down, which is a lot of recovery. But you know what? They're ready to go again when they get to the bottom. And it, it, it teaches them effort, it teaches them to monitor their breathing, and it teaches them how a hill can make or break them. I, I, in cross country especially, I guess there's no hills and tracks, so you don't have to worry about that, but in cross country, 
when we get to hills, I tell our kids, we, we don't charge the hills. We survive the hills. We just, just get to the top. Keep your breathing the same. Keep your, if you lose your breathing, slow down going up the hill so that once you get to the top, you're not in debt. And then you'll, you'll get back into pace quicker than those guys that, there's the hill, boy, and here they go. When they get to the top, they're like, whew, I still got two miles to go. And they're, they're done. And that's a foreign concept to them because my mindset was always as a runner, charge the hill. And it, it just kills you. So we, we, we really work on keeping their breathing focused on two out, two in, two out, two in, so that they're, they're under control as they run up these hills. Uh, again, it's a very high mileage day, and we, we follow it up with a very light day, a very easy day after that, because they are, they are toast after they do that. They will run harder than you want them to regardless, because when they're running, you know what they're doing. They're racing. Yeah. And they're, they're racing the clock, and they're racing each other a little bit, so you, you, you're just trying to hold them back a little bit, and usually for two or three reps you can, and then it's just kind of like... You know, you've made it enough into the workout that if you want to go a little faster, okay, as long as you can control what you're doing. And, and they will, they will, they want to see how fast they're going. Which, which I'm okay with, I think, because the next time we come to do hills, they kind of have a reference. Mm -hmm. So that they know if it's a good day or a bad day, necessarily. Uh, but those, those are two of the key things that I think we do. We will also do a lot of tempo runs. Tempo runs have a, a wide range of, of possibilities. Our kids love them. They would rather do a tempo run than anything else. And I, I figured out why, because there's no accountability. You can't, you, you know, if you do it out on the road or on the grass, it's kind of hard to measure how fast you're going or what you're doing. And, and I like that. I like that. Because if they want to be up towards the front, have to run up towards the front and so it, it challenges some of those guys it encourages some of those guys as they get better and they get a little bit closer to them that they're able to do things they couldn't do before because they're with the pack and that makes a big difference we'll do anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes of tempo we don't go much beyond 20 minutes in a session uh, as far as one rep uh, but we'll do repeats we may do a 20 minute a 10 minute a 5 minute <coughs> We may do four times five minutes, but it's, it's on the road or on the grass or somewhere. We've got a cross country course we go run on, you know, that, that they're doing something off of the track. We will rarely do it on the track. Progressive tempos, man, I love those. Every five minutes, you gotta pick it up a little bit. Well, how much, coach? I, a little bit, whatever you wanna do. And so it, it puts some of this onto them, you know, so that they have opportunities to, to improve as they're able to. But we, we do these once or twice a week. Uh, usually that'll be at least one of our quality workouts. And then we'll have repeats. And by repeats, you know, mile repeats, just, just really it's tempo runs that are measured, you know, pretty much. Uh, but we'll, we've got a couple places where we've got a loop on the grass that's a mile or a thousand meters or, or a, we use our baseball field. The warning track around our baseball field is 396 meters. And it's all dirt, but it's not a track, so it's it's different. And so we'll we'll go to the baseball field in the morning and do our do our repeat workouts there. That's that's one that we do that, that is kind of our measuring stick workout. You know, a lot of coaches will have a, a test at the first of the year to kind of measure where their kids are. Some do a time trial, like a 3K time trial or a, a, a distance time trial. I do repeat 400s. And so we'll, we'll get on the track and we'll cap our freshmen, our younger ones, we'll cap them at a certain level. Like it may be 12 for the girls and 14 for the guys. And then the upperclassmen can do up to maybe 18 or 20. But the goal is they have to, they have to run at the pace that's assigned to them. So if a freshman comes in and his PR in high school was 1630 for a 5K, that's your pace. He's got to figure out what that is, and that's what you're running. If a girl comes in, she was a 20-minute girl, that's your pace. But, Coach, they're running. Yes, they are, because they ran faster than you. You're running your pace. And if you finish this workout at that pace, next time we do this, you can run a couple seconds faster. But 
you're going to finish this at that pace. So we're, we're teaching control, right? And it also gives me a chance to evaluate what they're capable of. If there's ever a point they lose their pace, they can't run their 75 or 80 or 85 for the 400, they get one more, and if they don't do it again, they're done, no matter what number they're at. When they reach their cap, they're done. Even if they're running the paces we told them, they're done the first time. But that's kind of our measure stick. Probably every two to three weeks, we'll come back and do something very similar to this so that they have a reference point, so that they can move up. Maybe we add two, maybe we drop a second, so that they've got something to refer back to that's a, a, a certified, this is the same workout. Look how much better I'm getting as we go through the season. When we get to the end of the year, we'll come back and do what we did the very first workout, same numbers, because we're kind of in a tapering mode and it blows them away. They're five or six seconds faster for 400 with a little bit less rest, and they finish and they're like, that was easy. And you talk about a confidence builder. We, we've come back to the beginning and we're at a way higher level for 90% of them. There's always one or two that let you down. <laughs> you know, but, but for the most part, the ones you're counting on are gonna finish that workout and go, wow, that's incredible how much better we are. And your team will have some confidence you know, going into these last races. You don't have to do the quarters, right? I mean, it can be 800s, it can be 200s, whatever, whatever works for your kids. But I think, I think having some kind of a measuring stick to go back to is important. But also, not, it's not a beating stick, right? It's not something where they start the season and you go, I'm gonna crush you today. Let's see how tough you are. That's very different than, let's get an idea of what your fitness level is. And then we're gonna build on top of that. Just some points there y'all can look at and see, you know, that we kind of things we started about that, that uh, we're always we're always trying to make sure that they finish successfully. And if that means we start slower than they have to, that's okay. And once they've gained confidence and I've gained confidence, we'll start dropping paces. So but we're about three to four weeks out from the end of our season. We're coming into our, our conference championships. We'll begin to add some, a little bit of faster, more, more realistic race type situations where if we're gonna go in and do some mile repeats, we might do four by 200 first at a little bit faster pace. And then we'll run our three or five or six mile repeats with a shorter rest, but at, at race pace, at 8K or, or 5K race pace. And then we'll finish with three or four or five faster 200s. So they're, they're beginning to gain some confidence in, I can start fast, I can still run race pace, and I can finish fast. We're not gonna do it every day, but once, once a week, once or twice a week, we'll have something like that that we incorporate into their, their workout. Again, we make them stick to their real pace. We're towards the end of the season, we've had some races, so we kind of know where they are. And so it's not, not their dream pace, it's their real pace. Here's what you've run, so here's what you're gonna do. And some of them, as we enter this time and it gets closer and they, they realize season's winding up, they get a little bit better. We back off, the, because we're adding these twos and fours, we're backing off the volume just a little bit. Uh, and they, they tend to get a little bounce out of this. And they add some confidence into going out a little bit faster, you know, and feeling a little more confident and, and putting themselves in a better position uh, as they move into their, their cross country races. But again, same thing, if they can't handle it, if they go out too hard, workout's over. Uh, we're, not, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna run one hard rep and then slug through the rest of it. Uh, that's, just not, that's just not right. So they do a good job of sticking to that. Our taper is generally about a two week, two week deal, and we'll, we'll do it relative to the volume of each runner. If you got a kid running 20 miles a week, do they really need to taper? Three miles a day, what do you taper to? You know, that's, let's go to 18. I mean, you know, there's really not much you can do with that. But if you've got a 70 mile a week person, yeah, you drop them down to 45 or 50, that's, that's a significant difference. And they're gonna get a bump. Some kids don't like to taper. Again, we're not the smartest people sometimes, right? Coach, I'm gonna get out of shape. No, you're not. No, you're not. 
But sometimes what they think is more important than what's real. So it may be good to occasionally put in one of those workouts. It's kind of like what you were doing during the season, a good, long, hard tempo run. So they come back and go, okay, yeah, I still got it. You've got room for that, for those kids that need that. Other kids, that may scare them to death. Coach, I'm working too hard. I don't know if I'm going to be rested. All right, okay, man, let's just get you on the track today and do something. You know, let's just do an easier run today, or maybe, maybe you do half of that tempo. You've got to have room uh, to individualize what you're doing. And, and you know, again, this is different for different people. To me, you got to save the race for race day. I went to the state meet one year to recruit, and the, the little girl I was recruiting finished the race. It was just horrible. She was 45 seconds slower than, than she was supposed to run. It was horrible. She came over to me afterwards, and I, I said, man, what happened? I said, you look like you didn't feel very good. She goes, coach, I don't know. Yesterday, I ran 45 seconds faster. I said, what? She goes, yeah, we did a time trial yesterday, coach, and I ran, I ran this time. I said, oh. I'm sorry. What do you say? Your coach is an idiot. <laughs> Save the race for the race. Right. If they've done the preparation and you've done, you've done your input, they're going to be confident in what you're doing. You don't have to constantly tell. It's kind of like when you plant the seed. You remember you got the little seeds in the styrofoam cup? and you water it every day and you wait for it to grow, some kids keep digging it up to see if it's growing. It doesn't work. Once you've done it, trust it. And if you exude that confidence, yeah, you guys are gonna be ready, man. This is gonna be great. They will trust you, most of them. You gotta watch parents. Parents will take their kids out and test them. I know coach said to do this, but we need to do this and see if you're really ready. You gotta, you gotta call those parents up and say, hey, would you please let me be the coach? I love your interest and I love what you're doing, but we can't have, we can't have two coaches. You gotta trust me. You gotta trust me. You gotta shut them off, man, because that's horrible. You may have club coaches that are doing the same kind of thing, that, that sneak in and they want your kids. And they'll do your workout and then go to their workout. Be, you know, be aware of what's going on, and especially towards the end of the season in this tapering deal. Uh, it can be individualized. You can do different things for different kids, but I think that's a really important part uh, of that. Uh, how long do y'all go from your conference meets until your state meet in cross country? Just a couple of weeks? A couple so, of weeks. Okay, yeah. okay. If you have a great team, you don't need to taper for conference. If you know you're gonna win, man, you just train right on up and get another weekend if you need to. And then you taper more for the, the more important meets. If your goal is to, you know, just be better at conference, you may want to taper two weeks before conference or a week so that you're, you're ready at that meet. So it, it will depend upon kind of what level. You may have one kid who's going to go to the state meet, but nobody else is. So again, it, there's, there's a lot of individualization that you've got to do as you go into this part, because you've got to be creative uh, to make this happen. So we finish that and then you guys get to track season. I don't do track much differently. We spend more time on the track during track season, but our training is very similar. I used to not be that way. We used to hammer the track. And what I found over time was is, the less we got on the track, the better we ran. The more we stayed with the tempos and the long runs and the, the, the strength, the better we ended up running. So we, we kind of do this. So same type deal. We'll, we'll, choose, we'll choose our final date and count back. So we'll start with, again, with the preseason. Y'all's preseason is much longer here than ours is. We get about a month and a half, and then we start our, our indoor season. And we're, we've already had two meets, and so we're going at it. Uh, but our outdoor season concludes the end of May. Our conference meet is the first week of May, so we finish before you guys do. So ours, ours is pushed up a little bit. But again, after cross country, we're going to take 10 to 14 days of just, I don't want to see you guys. Y'all disappear. If you want to run, run, but keep it easy. I'd rather you bike and swim, go skiing, just don't hurt yourself. Do, do the things that you need to do to, to refresh. And when you come back, we'll start back up. And then again, it's just to me, it's just like summer training. We're going to, we're going to get back in the, in the weight room and doing the circuits and building strength and running a lot of long, 
long mileage, as much as they can handle. Trying to bump them up another level, maybe, mileage-wise. That's another opportunity to increase volume. You know, one of the things, and I don't think we talked about it in here, is, is going, going into each season, the hope is that as they go through their career that you can increase their volume every year. We use, we use the summer and the winter to determine if that's possible. So if, if they come into your program as a 20 mile a week person, and you bump them to 40 miles that fall, that's probably not gonna work. We'll start our kids, if they're 20 miles a week, we're gonna start at 20 miles a week and keep them there. You know, after three or four weeks, if they feel like they can handle more, we may, you know, if they're really low like that, we may bump them a little bit in the season, but they kind of have to prove it. And then over the winter time, we may bump them to 25 or 30 miles a week and they'll stay there through the spring. And then the next summer, if they wanna get better, we'll bump them to 35 miles a week maybe. So that over time, over time, each, each break time is when they have the opportunity to prove they can handle more miles. To throw more miles at them in a, in a competitive season is really hard to do. It's hard on them. Uh, again, some will because they'll develop really fast and they've been way under trained. Uh, but again, I would, I would about every three or four weeks, maybe you let them up a little bit more. I wouldn't come in and just say, hey, you wanna be great? You gotta run 60 miles a week, let's go. Be cautious with that. So preseason track, that's what we do. And then we'll go through kind of two, we, we don't gear for indoor season, we train through indoor season. That's, that's just a workout for us. When we go to an indoor meet, I don't really care how fast they run. We're, that's part of our training. Uh, just to keep them engaged and give them something to lose, kind of, kind of a benchmarks maybe. But we're not, gonna, we're not gonna rest for indoor season. We're doing a lot of this. A whole lot of this for six to eight weeks. A lot of long runs. They're getting in some eight, 10, 12, 15 mile runs. We're doing a lot of tempo work. We may do some on the track, uh, but not very often. Usually it's gonna be out on the grass or on the road or a dirt road somewhere. We will do some intervals. And by that, by, everybody has different definitions for intervals and repeats and all that kind of stuff. To me, intervals means that we're running set distances with set rest. Uh, when we run intervals, again, I'm, I'm worried, my goal during this time frame is to get them used to running at race pace, not, not to crush them. So we will take, we'll, if we run a 400, we're running repeat 400s, we'll take a 200 meter jog between each one. We're taking two, two minutes sometimes. If we're running repeat miles, Depending on the pace we're running, if we're running them at 10K pace, they'll get a minute and a half, two minutes rest, which is not a whole lot, but we're not running real fast. Uh, if we're running like repeat 600s at 1500 meter pace, uh, they're gonna get a 600 meter jog between each one. That's a lot of rest. But you know what? They can do a lot of reps. They can do a whole lot of reps when we do that because they're not worn out. And so, again, I'm, I'm more about the volume than I am about just crushing them. So we'll, we'll do things like that, you know, so that they can do maybe two or three times race distance at race pace because we're giving them enough rest. Then the next six to eight weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna drop the paces a little bit, drop the rest a little bit, but we're still, we're still working on race rhythm and strength at appropriate paces. They earn the pace by how they race. I, that's, that rhymed, didn't it? That was pretty good. I better write that one down. That, that's how they get to run faster in practice, is how they race. So if they're gonna do that, that's, that's where we go. There's gotta be enough rest to finish the workouts. And we're gonna continue some tempo runs and some long runs. Our races count as a quality day. We're not gonna do three hard workouts and then go race. We're, we're sticking to three quality days per week with what we're doing. And then we do our taper, which is kind of the same thing. We'll do some race simulations, but not, not race distances to do that. Am I out of time already? Ah, please. Final thoughts, man, and then I'll be quiet, okay? I, I, I just think these are critical, that you, you stick to your plan. You stick to your plan. If you've looked far enough in advance, You'll know when to take breaks. Stick to it. 
there will always be an athlete that doesn't want to rest. You're going to get to a, a, a week where it's supposed to be a backed off week and they're going to go, but coach, I'm feeling it. Hey, that's okay. Back off anyway. Back off anyway, because we're about to go to another level. And anytime you're about to go to another level, you better step back and catch your breath. Whew. All right, let's go. And they'll, they'll be at that other level better than if you just train straight through. So many times they're afraid to rest and they get to the end of the season just like a race and they're out of gas. Plan those, plan those times. Work around natural conflicts like spring break, test weeks, prom, and that kind of stuff. You know, if you know prom's coming up, make them work out that morning. Don't make them skip practice because they got to get their hair done or get their tux. Right? Work around them. They'll appreciate you for that very much. And it will, it will make them better. Again, I'll say never be afraid to rest or to cross train. That's, that's a big part of it. You know, on the PowerPoint, there's there's some sample workouts. If y'all want to, I think that's posted, isn't it? Should I be. think so. Okay. Uh, you guys are, are welcome. If you, have, if you have questions, feel free to call me about some of the things we do. Uh, but there's some samples of different times of the year. I try to always put a motivational quote at the bottom just so they've got things to remind them. You're speaking tomorrow, too. You can, you can maybe do oh, yeah. some of this if you want as yeah. well. Yeah, but none of them are coming back. <laughs> The dedicated ones will be back. Oh, no yeah. pressure. No right. pressure. Um, Thank you all for your attention. You're welcome. Much. Thank you very much. Uh, Johnny Josephson asked me to make an announcement. If you want a door prize and you got a card that has the name Caitlin on it, you're supposed to go to the registration table. Other than that, uh, the social starts at 4 upstairs. The banquet will be after that. You have about 20 minutes here to visit the vendors again. Do what you have to do, otherwise, four o'clock social hour bank will be after. And remember, tomorrow, um, the round table is yeah, it can, it's gonna be two things. It can, it can be some bounce back stuff, but Jeff Morris, the Perm, he's our president of our association. We're gonna actually talk about some cross country ideas and le legislation that we want to take to the advisory committee. And so, those are some things we want to talk about tomorrow, too. So anyway, just keep that in mind. It'll be in here after the first speaker in the afternoon. Okay. So I think I'm good on that. Say, Roswin is the bank. What else? Five thirty? I don't. Yeah, I think five maybe. Five. Five fifteen is what the Five what? Five fifteen. Five fifteen. Five fifteen. According to the gentleman over here. So you here. would have been late, Bill. One of your runners said 30, five. But if I said five, you'd have been early. Right. Right. So you have to. I'm going to flake out until. You've got to make a decision. Yeah. Oh. Oh.